Okay, so let's get started. So what we'll do today is I will start covering uh, what we call the initials of inter-process communication. And for this, one of the important things is this file abstraction. And in the Unix world, in the Unix world, we have uh, this, this file concept is so important is that you know everything including input output is done as if you're accessing a file what this means is you know when you're reading a, a character from a keyboard or when you're like you're sending the, the, like some music to your speakers your sound card it's always it has the same kind of semantic uh format which means you know what do you do with, when you want to access a file you open a file, you read something from a file, or you write into a file, or sometimes you see. So those primitive actions are actually hold true for all the I/O devices. Okay, and this is uh, you, what you can see is you know, like the disk, you know, the keyboard, the mouse. Uh, everything appears as a file, and as a matter of fact, as Onuroj has also discussed, for example, your mouse. And you look into the file system, you will see these devices like mouse or keyboard or audio that they appear as files. And what this means is, you know, you don't have to know about how to access a mouse. It's no longer, it's no, no different than accessing any other file in your system. Okay. So this is, and when we look into our, uh, the whole uh, format of this, uh, there's this uh, C standard where it provides uh, you, when you look at, for example, it, it provides uh, these functions that are kind of related to the system calls. And these provide you, allow you to read, or write files in your applications. But there's actually, like when you do this, there's a little bit of buffering between the program and actual files, and I will discuss this towards the end of this set of lectures. Uh, for example, when you're, when you're reading from the keyboard, um, you don't read uh, character by character, but rather you read only when the end of line is being appears, okay? And actually the operating system does a lot of bookkeeping. For example, when you're typing things, uh, if you go, if you press backspace, Instead of sending you, you know, A, B, C, and then backspace, and then D, uh, it wraps them, it does a little bit of editing, and then sends you the, you know, the uh, properly formatted uh, uh, string uh, in one batch. And usually, you know, uh, these, uh, like in your have this, when you're writing your C code, you usually use like, you know, F open, F read, F scan F, et cetera. So these are the, Fun, the, the, these are the library calls that provide you to access your files and this is standard IO functions. And when you look inside, they're not by itself uh, system calls, uh, but when you look into them, these, their implementations actually include the uh, Unix IO functions, which are then accessible via system calls, like just open, write, read, seek, close, start, and etc. Now, in the Unix world, uh, when you look at a file, a file is essentially a sequence of n bytes. Okay, so this is just, uh, or sometimes it's, you can see this as a stream. Okay, and we said that all I/O devices are represented as files. Like it can be your partition, it can be your terminal, and even the kernel is actually represented as a file. For example, under slash proc, you can access the kernel data structures and, you know, and Honor just has shown some examples on this. And for this, uh, we all know that you can open and close files, okay? Read or write or sometimes you just see. And what you have is when you open a file, you get a pointer to the beginning of the, this byte sequence. And typically you have a file position, okay? But then you can move this file position, file uh, basically position, either by reading. So if when I read one character, then this file position moves here, okay? Or sometimes you can just do a C and you can move the file position to another 
uh, location uh, in your stream. So these are all possible, and this is just regular file access. And what we do is uh, we, like one of the things that, for example, that had puzzled me at the beginning was, you know, if you want to read anything from a, a file, you have to open it. Okay, and then after you open, you get a file descriptor and then you use this file descriptor to read from a file. Now, this is, it's kind of like, you know, you may ask when I first learned about this, like as an undergraduate, I said that, you know, this is kind of stupid. Why, why, why do I have to open a file? Why can't I just, you know, pass the path on my file and then read a character from it? Why do I have to open it? And you, these are the things why, uh, like, you know, the reason behind this is actually related with how the operating system is structured. And we will learn a bit uh, in this lecture and plus some other things in the file systems, uh, uh, in our file systems coverage. So we all know that, you know, like what you do is when you open, you, when you use an open, you, you give the file name and you see how, long, how you want to access it, for example, read only. And what you do is you get a file descriptor, which is just an integer, okay? And you know that, you know, we can, you have to check for this FD for error. And if it's less, minus one, it means that there is an error either in accessing the file or maybe the file does not exist and so on. Now, for each process in Unix, uh, when, you, when it starts, it already has three special files that are open, okay? And these special files are, well, you already know them, standard input, standard output, and standard error, okay? And these, so these are, in the early days, like when you, like, uh, when you open a terminal, uh, we actually had actual physical terminals, okay? And uh, by default, these, this, the uh, standard output would go to like here, standard error, error is would also go to here, and standard input would read from this keyboard, okay? So these are all IO devices. And uh, nowadays when you pop up an op, like a, a window, you no longer see this, but you know, we still have the same semantics at the background, okay? So nowadays we're just using the UR virtual terminals here with SSH. Now, what happens at the basically at the kernel level? And what, what do we mean by standard outputs and their error and et cetera? Now, when you open a file, and this is like in the kernel space, when I say in the kernel space, uh, it's basically uh, the kernel keeps tracks, uh, basically creates and maintains a set of data structures per process, okay? And these data structures are actually what constitute the operating system resources that I had talked about. So typically, uh, well, not typically, but for every process, uh, the kernel keeps a descriptor table, okay? And it is basically one table per process. And what this table does, is it's a simple table. It's a, it contains pointer to the open files. For example, and by default, as I said, like the first three files that are in this file descriptor table, in this uh, descriptor table are standard input, standard output, and standard error, okay? And uh, for example, to give you an idea, the standard input is goes to the keyboard, okay? Which appears, and standard output and error, they both point to your terminal, like where you print things out, okay? And in here, uh, then for each file that is open, we have, an open file table. And what this keeps track is, it's like it, among other things, it keeps track of your file position inside, like in the file. And remember that, you know, if I had this file here, and at the beginning, you had a pointer pointing to the beginning. And when you read, then this pointer moves ahead, moves uh, in, the, in the file. And this file position keeps track of that, okay? your user program doesn't do that, but they, it, and this information is actually kept in this open file table. And then, you know, it also keeps track of how many other uh, pointers are pointing 
uh, basically to this particular file table. And if you open like other files, then the, the descriptors like that we have here, uh, basically you, in this table, this table grows and you get other pointers to them. For example, uh, when you open like a second file, okay, then you get another pointer. And if, uh, like if you open, uh, sorry, if you open another file, then you get, for example, FD4, which is again pointing to this, uh, say, file B, which can be on the disk, okay? And these, as you can see, like the file descriptor, which was an integer, is actually refers to the index of these, uh, of your pointers in this descriptor table. Now, it can be like, you, when you can, what you can do is, if you open the file, you can open the same file twice. Okay, the very same file twice. And what you would do yeah. is, yes. Uh, we not, we not, in we not table are uh, single per file, right? Yes, like... that's, co that's correct. Okay. We will learn about this later in the file systems part, but this is just to, you know, get you warmed up. I have uh, a question too, by the way. Uh, does the reference count here used for a garbage collector in the file system? Uh, garbage collector for what? Uh, for the file system. I mean, uh, there are reference counts here, right? Right. Are they used for a garbage collector like? Uh, uh, it, it, it is that usually this reference count keeps track of how many pointers does it get. Okay, if it's one, so when, it, uh, when you remove, when you close a file, then this ref count is decremented by one. And if it's zero, then this whole data structure, this whole table is discarded. Okay, so when I try to delete the file, uh, if its reference count is not zero, then system uh, turns me an error, error right? Uh, yes, it should return error. It should at least give you a warning. Okay, okay. because it went like that. Yeah, got it, okay. thanks. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is a case where I mean, I have uh, the same file, okay? Like let's say that it's file name is whatever this, you know, A, uh, the same file on the disk is opened twice. And in the first one, for example, you know, it's uh, pointed to here, okay? In the second one, and you can see that the, at the level of this V node, which you will learn later in file systems course, they both tell you this, uh, this data structures uh, keeps track of you know the file size, file name, file type, and etc. You where are the blocks, the data blocks stored on the disk, etc. So all these things are stored in here, and there is basically one V node, okay, per file. But if you open the file twice, then we have two entries in the open file table, and the reason is we need to keep track of two different file position. Uh, basically file positions in each other. For example, when I open this, I can read from the same file using, you know, this one, file descriptor one or file descriptor four, okay? And they will, uh, what this means is like, if this is, for example, if this is my file, okay? And initially, let's uh, that I have these two pointers, like let's say that I, and let's say I have A, B, C, D, okay, it has these four characters. When I open them up, and then I have these file pointers, uh, the, the file basically positions, and in both of them, they will point to the same character, like it's zero, okay? So let's say that this is one and two, they are both pointing the same. And then after, if I read from file descriptor one, then this, my file for, for this one, it will remove now, it will, advance to B, okay? Whereas the file position pointer for two will remain at A, okay? So with this, this is actually, you know, this allows you to basically uh, go through the same file using different pointers. And this is, now what's interesting is, and what we are more interested in, like uh, for, for the couple of weeks is how the processors share files, okay? So as I said, like initially, okay, when we, like before fork, for example, let's say that we have a process 
Okay, and in this process, we have some open files. Okay, and in this particular case, we will just focus on this, like a, that we have file A and say file B. Okay, and they both point to different files and etc. Okay, so this is our parents descriptor table. This is basically parents. Okay, now when you fork, then what you will do is that something interesting happens. Uh, in the for the child, remember we have been duplicating everything, right? We have been duplicating the uh, CPU state. We have been dupl we duplicate the address space, okay? And what we also do is we also duplicate uh, like we but we share the operating system resources. And in this case, the open files here is a resource. And what you do is you duplicate the parents file descriptor table to the child, okay? And since these are pointers, they will continue to point to the very same open, basically open file tables, okay? So you can see that in, the, in this case, the child and the parent, they are both pointing to the very same files and they are sharing the same thing. And you can see that this ref counts is now incremented to two because uh, they are being pointed by two different pointers from two different uh, basically processes. And we can see that this opens up the possibility of having some form of communication between the parent and the child, which we will make use of, okay? So uh, do you have any questions so far? Hmm? Oh, Jam, I have a question. Uh, Descriptor tables uh, are pointed from process control blocks, right? Uh, it, right? Yes. Okay. okay. So this, all these things in the kernel space, these data structures are uh, created and maintained by the operating system. Okay. So when you create a process, this descriptor table is created by the uh, by your uh, by the kernel on behalf of you, and it's keep that so you cannot access it, but you use it through the system calls. And V nodes are like process control blocks. I I understand. Uh, like they are similar for files, like the, the V nodes. V nodes. Uh, don't worry about the V nodes at this time. It's a little bit early. I I mean, what uh, what I suggest is that the, what the V nodes do is. When you have a file, like let's say, say that I have a file on the disk, right? And in this file, I have some data. So there are a lot of information that you need to keep track of. What is uh, things like, you know, what's the name of the file? You have to store the name of the file, uh, not in the data part, but some, somewhere else. You need to keep track of, you know, who is the owner, what's the size of the file, what's the um, last access, you know, when was it last written? And uh, most importantly, which disk blocks contain the data for this particular file. So all this information is contained in this structure, okay? But we will discuss this in whole detail and you will have a, your, I think the third assignment will be on this. So don't worry, you'll learn this inside out. So this is basically- Mm -hmm. I have another question. Uh, what happens if we want to modify the same uh, file uh, at the same time from different processes? Uh, you mean between parent and child? Yeah. Uh, the, you will be modifying the very same file. Okay, uh, but uh, like uh, if we do it uh, like uh, we open uh, the same file twice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you want to write twice the same file, well, I, I I have I have a couple of examples coming up. Just you know, be patient. Okay. Now let's see basically uh, how we can use this to implement certain things. Like you know, I'm pretty sure when you're using shell, you've been using your shell redirection, right? And in the shell redirection, like uh, you have an executable. And when you put this greater sign and then you have to type in some file name, all of a sudden your program writes 
it prints whatever it's printing into this file, right? Now, this is kind of the, the, it's it's this is a little bit magical. Why? Because the executable for this program has not been changed yet. Okay. Initially, it was if if I did not do this here, like without this, it would have printed its results on your screen, right? But when I do this, then all of a sudden, my the same executable will be printing them into a file, okay? Now, the executable remains the same, but so I haven't, we don't recompile it. And so how does this happen? Do you have any idea? Hmm? Uh, FT is directed to the file? Yes, that's basically, that's, that's basically what happens, but you know, this is why you need to understand that those file descriptor tables and we need to manipulate this and we will see how we can do this, okay? So the output of the, the program is, mm -hmm. is connected to the TXT file? Yes. In, in this case, the, so if I have this like my program, this is my executable, initially, it will have printed to my screen, okay, like this. If I use this, if I do this uh, greater some file text, then instead of writing into this your monitor, into this monitor, sorry, uh, into this monitor, then it will be printing out into your file. Okay, so it will be different. But the executables, the instructions in this file are the same. And uh, you can do the same thing and like, you know, like this, with this inward, basically, uh, of a, um, um, less than sign, which now, instead of reading from the keyboard, it will be reading its input from this file and writing its output to here, okay? Or sometimes, you know, what you want is you can run your program and instead of printing the errors onto your screen, you want them, you want to redirect them to a file, okay? So these things are all happen. And, and you know, uh, we will see basically how this can be done. So <clears throat> now let's see, like, as I said, like the standard input, standard output and standard error, they're all file pointers. And initially when every process, the, the, the standard output and the, the error, they point to the display and standard input event is basically pointed to your keyboard. Okay, that's it. And so with this, now what I want to do is, if you want to point this right into it, like this, this is my executable, okay? And if I want to write this into say foo.text, okay? Then I need to, I can do this by changing this pointer, this FD1 pointer, which used to point to the display to an open file, okay, which is this foo.txt, okay? So you can see that by just my, by keeping my executable the same, but uh, only changing the content of my descriptor table such that it will point instead of to a display to this new file, then I can change the behavior of my executable such that the output is now directed to foo.txt on the disk, okay? Now, this is, the, so this is how it happens, but how can we achieve this? Now, remember, this is kernel space. So this direction, redirection cannot be handled by you because you are, your program is a, at the, you operates at the user level. So we can do this, we need some system calls to do any kind of modification on this descriptor table to do this. And we will actually now learn how to do that. We cannot modify this directly because this is the kernel space? Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you very much. So like, as I said, this is a data structure. It's, um, it's a data structure for the process, but it is in the protected, uh, in the kernel space or in the, it's in the reference section, if you wish, okay? So this is like your transcript. 
that you know it belongs to you. You need to use it. It's updated for you, but you're not allowed to have uncontrolled access to it. So uh, I will te teach you two uh, uh, system calls for this. Okay, one of them is called DUP. Okay, DUP is a shorthand for duplicate. Okay, and what it does is it duplicates a file descriptor. And you can see that in my descriptor table, you know, typically, you know, this table like has, like it can have many entries as such, but you know, if you have like at the beginning, like you only have these three of them. So like, this is where your descriptor table ends here. Okay, below this, you don't use because they're not used. So when you open a new file, uh, this, you allocate the next available file descriptor such that it would point to some other here, okay? And then basically now this means that it's here. So you get this uh, file descriptors, you know, one by one. And, you know, when something is closed then it becomes available and etc. So what the file, what the dupe does is the following. It duplicates a given uh, file descriptor. It takes one parameter, this is an FD, and it duplicates and it returns the new file descriptor. For example, in this particular case, I say dupe one, okay? Now one is here, okay? And what, what this means is, and you know that I know that like no other files are open. So this was, this gets, and it looks at the first available file descriptor, which is three, okay? And then it duplicates this. And remember, this is like, I'm using this as a pointer, but it's essentially uh, like just a pointer value. So with FD, like when I say dupe two, you duplicate, you copy this value here, such that now it also points to the same open file. Okay, is it clear? So this is just a duplicate in this case, you know, you duplicate an existing file descriptor and it returns you the new one. And in this case, you know, you dupe one and it gives you three, okay? If- What if dupe one instead, what if this dupe one may, becomes dupe two? Uh, if yes, exactly. So let, let's do that. Now, if instead of this, let let's say that after this, let me write uh, one more thing. As let's say that uh, I would say, you know, uh, new for like let's say that n f t. Okay, equals dupe two. Okay, so I'm adding a new line. Now, what this will mean is now the next available one is uh, basically two. So it copies, uh, let me do this with a different color. So what you do is you copy this one to here, the next one. Now this points to this here, okay? The file descriptor for will be std error? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. But in this case, the std error and the std out are pointing both to the display. Hocam, bu, std in, std out are just like variables. Uh, just like files, it's, file, it's open files. When I print std out mm -hmm. as a value, they, it, mm -hmm. just, it just give two. Yes, exactly, or, it's an, it's an integer. Yes. Is that, okay. Now, so that's the first one. Okay. Now let's look at the second one, which is dupe two. Okay. Now dupe two, this is like you know, it's, uh, this is slightly interesting. It takes two arguments. Okay. And you know, it says you know old FT and new FT and it copies them into each other. So the way like I keep track of this is that, you know, dupe two, like I mean, say dupe two, 
and you know, say old FD and new FD. Okay, this is equivalent to the way I want to I read this is it's like a, a copy. Copy the old FD into new FD. Okay, so you copy this into here. Now, how does it work? Let's say that in this case, you know, we have it uh, like we are at here and we want to do two, let's say that, uh, okay, let me start here. So uh, we start our process, we open a new file, foo.txt, which is here. And for foo.txt, we get a new FD, like foo FD, which is actually, which would actually be three. Okay, it points to here. And then after that, like, you know, I execute this dupe two, full FD, okay, standard output, okay? Now, when you see this, this is like, you know, read this like a copy, copy full FD, like, which is in here, this one, you copy this into standard output, which is here. And when you do this, guess what happens? Now, all of a sudden, the standard or standard output now points to foo.txt, okay? So that means that from now on, remember your printf by default is printing on the standard output file descriptor, which is one. Uh, and your, so your executable is running the same instruction, printing on uh, the file descriptor one, okay? But this time, it will actually be writing into this for that text on the disk, okay? Now, just to again give you, like you even make things more clear, like uh, we have, uh, I have provided you the pseudo code and it's like this. So let's say that I have this descriptor table, DT, okay? And basically, what you do is when you have this dupe command, this is not again, there's nothing magical. It's as simple as this, okay? So what you do is you get the lowest available file descriptor in your table. This is like, a, sometimes you may, like when you close them, some of them may close up, so it become available, okay? And then what you do is you go to the your descriptors table, you copy the pointer value at your old FD, into the new FD in the descriptor table, and you, you return it. This is it. There is nothing magical about this duplicate. This is your system call implementation, okay? And the only thing that makes this magical is that this is executed by the, uh, by the kernel at the kernel level. So this is what the FD does. And what about the dupe two? Uh, in the case of dupe two, Remember, this was equivalent to like a copy. You're basically doing a copying from old to new. And this is this is actually what happens. You copy the old one into the new one and you return the new FD. That's it. Okay. So let's do some examples. And these examples are actually from our um, uh, control organization books. Uh, so these slides are also from the, I think like on the website, you may actually have these uh, source codes for this. But the reason I like them is, uh, um, you know, since I have very limited screen space, uh, since I have very limited screen space, uh, I don't have to worry about this, uh, you know, whether it returns with error, et cetera. This is just to simplify things. Your actual code is actually much messier. So here, let's look at this particular example. So I have this program and what I do is like, you open this up and so what we do is let's keep, keep track of our uh, descriptor table, DT. Okay. And in this one, so this is zero, this is one, this is two, okay. And so these two point to uh, your, standard output or this to your display, okay? And that's it. Now, what I do is here, like in this part, you see it creates a file name and then it opens and returns it as FD1, okay? 
what this means is, you know, I the next available descriptor is here. So now I have a file. Uh, let me see. Remember, this will be slightly. Uh, let me do this. Let me draw this again because I'm running out of space. So let me put my descriptor table here. Uh, I didn't hear back from you. Can you come again? No, okay. So when I open this file in of uh, f name, okay, that's uh, in here. What I do is, you know, it returns the ft1 is now three, okay? Because that's the next available one. And it will point to a new open file in here. And in here, you can remember that I have this file position. And in here, this also points to your file, basically, uh, the V node here, okay, which gives strength. And then what I, what happens, you know, I open the same file again. Now in this case, you know, I have for the fourth one, this one will return as four, okay. And it will open again, the same thing with a new file position, 5.2, like file position here, but pointing to the, again, the same V node here. And then you open it again. So at file descriptor five, then you get again another case. And this one also points to the same file. Okay. And in my file, let's assume that let me show this here. So this is my file. Okay. And in my file, I have A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. Now, then initially, I have these five, uh, three, four, five. They are all have uh, this file position. And initially, they will all be pointing to the A here. Okay? They are pointing the same thing. And then after that, what I do is I do a dup2, FD2 to FD3. Hmm. Now, the, the, you know, what happens here? I'm, I'm accessing the same file, but something different is bound to happen. So I do dup2, fd2, the fd3, okay? So see, fd2 is, okay want it here, I copy this into FD3. Okay. So all of a sudden, let's see this. This, uh, let's see, FD2 is, this is, let me just see, this is FD1, this is FD2, and this is FD3, okay? So when I do this dup FD2 to FD3, uh, then you copy this content to here, okay? And when you do so, now then my, this, uh, the, my FD3 will point to here, okay? So this link is gone, this part is gone. Now, they are, I'm still pointing at the same V node. I'm still accessing the same uh, file, but what is different? Well, what's different is, now in this case, when you access FD2 or FD, FD3, you will be sharing the very same file, the, the file position variable, okay? So, and this will get things interesting. So after this, let's say we do a read and we read a character from FD1 and put this into C1, okay? So from FD1, like which is this here. So I read one character 
and now my FT1 will be pointing up to here, okay? And in this case, you can see that C1, okay, is set to A. And after this, the FT, oh, sorry, this is, so this, uh, it moves here. And then after that, I read from FT2 and put this into C2. And in this case, C2 is now becomes also A, right? Because I have read from A. Now, the since FT2 and FT3 are pointing at the same thing here, so they are lumped together. After reading this C2, now they will both be at pointing to B, okay? Then I read from FT3. When I read from FT3, now FT3 will, will then be, uh, <coughs> now the FT3 will then be reading, not from like the A, but it will be reading from B, okay? Because the file position is incremented by one, True, when I do this, it doesn't have a separate file descriptor. The FT3 doesn't have a separate file descriptor. Instead, it's sharing the same file descriptor. So if you read from FT2, the file position, uh, basically pointer, it moves by one. So you read from that. So as a result, as a result, all this, I will be like this one printing C1 as A, C2 as A, and the C three as B, okay? Any questions on this? Hujam, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, Normally in C, when we open a file, we also need to close it, but after we used uh, DAP2, we didn't close anything. Actually, we didn't close uh, any of the files. Will, will this cause a problem? Uh, it's it's good practice. Yes, uh, I will tell you basically, especially in the file systems part, uh, uh, what closing does. Uh, closing does uh, basically uh, opens up, uh, re uh, releases some of these structures. Sometimes when you read or write from a disk, uh, it's actually not written, it's just cached. So the close operation actually forces these, uh, the, the unwritten data physically written onto the physical disk and so on. Okay, so that's, it's good practice in all cases in here. I, I do this, I show this in this minimal thing because I don't have screen space, but good point. Where can Pleasure. we find Thanks these so examples like this? Hmm? Where can we find these examples like this? Uh, examples like this, what, what do you mean by this? E exercises. Oh, exercise. Uh, I don't know, like, you know, <laughs> I, I, maybe you can read the book. Uh, I'm not sure whether the book has this, but this is, I don't know, like, in, maybe you can, if you go to the, uh, the computer organization books website, you may have some exam questions similar to this. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is basically what we do. And here's uh, another example. And in, 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 in this case, like uh, we, what we do is like, it's, it's interesting. We open again a file, okay? And we get a file descriptor. And then, you know, we read a character, again to C1. Again, again, the entire file is contains this. And then, but what we do is we do a fork. Hmm. And after fork, then we execute these two different uh, code in the case of uh, uh, parent and the child. Okay, now what happens here, let me see. Maybe I can show this. Okay. So let's work this through, okay. Now, initially I have a parent, right? The parent has this descriptor table. So I will not worry about standard input and output. I will only focus on this file name descriptor, which is resides at uh, four, 
no, it's you know, it's a three, sorry, okay, which is the FD one, okay, and which actually points to the file name here, which again has a pointer here, and then this points to its corresponding V dot, okay. So what we do is initially, you know, after opening this up, we read one character into C1. And in the case of my file, okay, remember if this is my file and it contains A, B, C, D, E, initially it was pointing to here, right? And when I read this character with this first three, then it advances into B, okay? And so uh, as a result, what I know that you know C1 is assigned to A. And after this, we do a fork. And when I fork, then uh, now after fork, now I have the child, which is printed in here with the blue. Okay. And since this is duplicated with FD1 equals three, it also points to the same uh, open file, okay? And hence it's sharing this position that's here, which is initially, let's say it was zero, now it's at one, okay? And, you know, after, like when we, when we fork, now we have two processes. Uh, the parent and the child. And do we know who runs first? Well, we don't know, okay? And because, you know, the, the operating system can decide to run any of them at any time. Uh, in this case, basically, what we uh, did some kind of a random thing, which is if we look at here. So you get the PID on this and you end it with one, which means that this S, okay, uh, it will either be zero or one at random. Okay, it depends whether your PID is odd or even. Okay, and let's say that, you know, depending on this, then we have this sleep. So if the S is zero, okay, then the parent sleeps um, with zero, which means that if S is zero, then the parent executes first, okay? And then the child sleeps for one second. Then it means that uh, basically then the, the child executes, okay? Whereas if S is one, then the child executes first because then it doesn't sleep here. Whereas the parents, and then the parent executes, okay? Now with this, now let's say that for S equals zero, what will, what will happen? So when S equals zero, uh, the parent will execute first. What this means is, you know, it will read into C2 a new character. So C2 then becomes, well, B, because my was pointing to B. And after doing this, now my, basically this, uh, uh, this thing moves into, C, okay. So with the and the and the parent will print out, and here it will print this parent, and then it will say C one equals A, and then C two equals B, okay. And then after this, then the child after coming back from this one second sleep, it will come back and it will execute. In this case, you know. Yeah, and then when it reads here, C2, now it will read here, C2 will be read as C because my pointer is adv has advanced to here and hence it will print out, you know, child and C1 was still A, okay? But now C2 will be C, okay? Now, this is the case for S equals zero. If it's S equals one, then 
it will be, uh, can anyone tell me what will happen if S equals one? Hmm? Child AV, parent AC. Child, Child AV. AV, exactly. And the parent AC. Parent AC. Yes, exactly. Good job. So you can see it here. So what I will do is uh, let's wrap this up before we move on to our uh, break. Uh, so if you want to like learn more about this, like there's this excellent, but this is really old, like by Stevens, okay, the advanced programming Unix environment. And this is really, really nice. It has a lot, it, you will see a lot of the details on how to code and it goes beyond like it, you will learn about TCP IP, network programming, but things like, you know, I, IPC and Unix programming, these are the portions that is very uh, basically relevant to this and it's available at this link. Okay. So there is uh, some bonus material that I want to provide here. I will just briefly uh, gloss over them, but uh, because you will be needing them in your assignment. The first thing is, well, in your system calls, you have to always deal with error handling, okay? And uh, whatever, whatever you do, you have to check with this. And uh, typically in, in Linux systems, like, you know, the return is like minus one in the case that there's an error. And usually it sets the global variable and not to indicate the cause, which can basically then, you know, use this to print out the actual error here. And uh, this is again uh, from the CSF, which is the, the Computer Organizations textbook uh, that this has uh, actually wrote some wrappers, wrapper function that will make uh, this uh, error reporting much easier and the code much cleaner. And for example, in the case of fork, it has, it has this capital fork and in here, yeah, like it does this error reporting here. This is just the you know simplified version where now you can use this. And you may realize that in my codes, uh, in my code, I have been using a capital dupe or capital dupe two or capital you know open and read and so on. So these are all these similar versions of this. Okay. And uh, the second thing that's important is called buffering. When you're using standard IO functions such as your printf and other things, uh, all the things that you write are buffered. But what this means is, you know, when you do, when you want to write a character or when you want to read a character, uh, since the overhead is quite high, it doesn't immediately try to read and return or write and return. And what it does is, you know, it, uh, it uh, the, the operating system keeps track of a buffer. And in this buffer, okay, it writes all the characters and then it will print them out only after slash n, okay? And this is where we have this flush, which is, you know, you write everything in the buffer at once, uh, like either, you're, you, you know, when you encounter a slash x slash n or an f flush call, then your basically uh, uh, the, whatever you're writing is printed on the screen or whatever you want to read is read, okay? And you can see this again, this buffering in action using this Unix asterisk, which is actually, uh, it prints out the list of system calls made by the program. Mm -hmm. Is it definitely same for all the time? Like without backslash gen, doesn't can can won't it be disappear the, the printf? Mm, no, well, without slash n, it will not print. It will remain in that or uh, f flash. Maybe the uh, when contact when kernel do flash automatically. Mm. Uh, no. It, 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 it won't do that automatically. I will uh, go through a simple example, okay? So uh, here you can see, for example, I'm printing like, you know, these characters, hello, okay? In uh, like five or six characters, okay? And only like at this point, you can see that when you, when you look at this, 
all these things, they do not like it, it doesn't create a system call. So they are not creating a separate, you know, I'm not getting these you know, six different system calls here. Instead, you can see that, you know, in one batch, you have this right system call, okay? Which is your write all these things at once, okay? So you can see that it's not writing one K and this is, indicates how many characters that it's writing. This is the FD, which is the standard output. And then it writes all of them at once. So you, we are not seeing six right system calls. We're just seeing one right system call because um, the whole thing is buffered, okay? And let's uh, look at this you know, fork example that we have discussed in when we were learning about earlier uh, about fork. And this was basically uh, like two forks in advance. And in when we print this out, you know, this is the process graph, okay? Now, now look at this backslash n. This backslash n means that, you know, all these strings, the printfs are printed on the screen, you know, like when they, uh, upon executing. Now, if you remove the backslash n from here, okay? Then something interesting happens, you know, like, so this, so this L0 remains in the buffer and is not printed. And then after fork, then we print when we try to basically uh, print L1 and then backslash N, then you will see that L0, L1 and L0, so L0 is printed twice. Because basically, you know, like you have this, this buffer is duplicated with L0 basically in the buffer. Look at here, in this case, L0 is printed only once. Okay, because it's flushed due to this backslash n. But in here, you will see this L0, which was printed by the parent before the fork is actually duplicated because when I fork, this whole buffer is also duplicated. Hence, you will see two L0s, okay? So this can be very confusing for you know, newcomers. This flushing also uh, same for scanf. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. When we press enter using scanf, enter mm -hmm. uh, enter is uh, exactly following. Exactly. So, for example, you know, imagine I'm writing my like you know say uh, hello. So you write you type you're typing in characters H E. Okay. And uh, here and you say you know, hell, and then you pr press say P. Okay, and then after this, this is wrong. Then you press backspace. Okay, then you press L and then O. Okay, and then here you press enter. Now you can see that if you try to read this, like send this as it is, you know, this is the sequence of characters that was pressed. But instead, since this is due to this buffering, it does some editing and sends you hello. Okay, as a, in one character, in one string. Okay, so this whole editing is done by the kernel such that you don't have to deal with this. Okay, so uh, let's give a break now. Okay, and uh, we will continue in 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so given basically this, uh, the input output, uh, the communication through opening the same file, now we can cover what we call the IPC or inter-process me communication mechanism, okay? And we say that, you know, like when we have processes, they each live in their own separate world. Okay, and they are not aware of any other guys. It's like, you know, you have this world, okay, and this whole world belongs to you and there's no one else in it. This is an illusion that's been provided by the operating system, okay? And basically this is done because, you know, we, the uh, operating system provides this memory address space uh, virtual, virtualization and also the CPU virtualization. And hence, you know, there is no way that they can see each other, okay? But sometimes, you know, 
you need some communication between different processes. Uh, for example, you know, if a process's address space is completely separate, then how can you kill a process using a shell command, right? This is like, you know, you have no idea. Or how can you send data between processes? Because, you know, like process A's address space and process B's address spaces are completely separate. And hence, you know, whatever you want to do, like you live in this world and you basically, there is no formal communication. This is actually really good for security and protection. But um, as I said, you know, if you want to do some sort of communication, then you need some extra mechanisms, okay? So these mechanisms are what we call this IPC, okay, inter-process communication. There are a lot, uh, like a, uh, a different set of them. Each of them are good for separate purposes. Uh, for example, if you want to do some data transfer between processes, there is, or you want to do, if you want to do a sharing data, uh, I mean, to think of this, it's, uh, for example, uh, you want to, like, I want to have, like, two processes, so I want one of them, for example, to download some files for me, and the other one reads and displays it, okay? Or sometimes you want to do some event notification, some resource sharing or process control, okay? And these processes may even be running on, you know, different computers connected by a network, okay? And uh, it's also important, so like, you know, how uh, regarding this, this IPC, uh, is it just a, a simple, like, informal communication, like, you know, a couple of bytes, or is it just like it's, um, if, the, uh, if the data is very large or if you need fast communication, and et cetera, okay? So the IPC, like, uh, is basically, this, it provides this set of mechanisms that are implemented usually by the operating system, and they are also referred as inter-application communication. So the, what we will do is we will uh, cover some IPC mechanisms, uh, like, you know, like pipes, okay? And we will cover two different pipes, unnamed pipes and uh, named pipes, which is also known as FIFO, first and first time. We'll cover shared memory, message queues, signals, memory mapping, and a little bit remote processes like remote procedure calls or sockets. Okay, but these things will be much lighter than the ones that will be covered here. So let's start with pipes. Okay, these are also like when we say pipe, it means like it's an unnamed pipe. And what it is is that you know when we have this process A and process B, they have their own address spaces. And what you see as a byte is a byte is essentially a, a simple uh, data structure. It's like a, it's just an array, okay? And uh, that appears in the kernel space, since so it's not in the uh, uh, private address space solar. And then, you know, then the, the uh, processes can read or write from this pipe, okay? This is a common data structure that's shaped uh, between them. Okay, so how is it? So, so this means that obviously, if you want to use these pipes, uh, you need to use some uh, system calls to create them and to use them. Okay, and uh, the first thing is I said the pipe is essentially a data structure in the kernel space. Okay, and the data that's stored in here is temporary. Uh, there's no random access, so it's like a pipe that's you push data from one end and you read from the other end. It's as such. And so it is created by a system called, called pipe, okay? And it's as simple as this, you say a pipe, and here you give an, uh, a, a, an, uh, an integer array of size two, okay? And it returns you basically uh, the, uh, the, whether it's to well, you get the file descriptors in this FD, okay? And then this one returns, you know, zero or minus one, uh, depending on the error or success of this. And uh, when it returns, as I said, you know, when I have my FD, okay? It has, I have this, you know, 
this is ft0, ft1, and if the zero is open for reading and if the one is open for writing, okay? And uh, usually this is a, a unidirection pipe, which I will see, you'll be seeing that, and both ends are readable or writable. And typically, you know, the data structure is uh, the typical buffer size is 512 bytes, okay? And uh, also important is that the reads and writes may be blocked by the buffer. What this means is, there's nothing in the pipe, then uh, when, you, and when you have the read, issue a reads call, then it may be blocked. Or if you have to write into a buffer that's already full, then again, you will be blocked and we will see that this will create some interesting problems. So the typical use is, you know, we create a pipe uh, in a process and then we call fork, okay? And when we call this fork, the file descriptors, that's, they are inherited by the chat. Remember the file descriptors are essentially, well, um, a way uh, this, this pipe will appear as a file, okay? And hence, as a result, the pipe is also shared with the child, okay? And then we can use this pipe as a communication medium before parent, uh, between parent and child, okay? And this is like, you know, uh, this is, implemented in the shell if you ever do things like you know there's who then you pipe this into sort and then you pipe this into lpr and so on okay and this is allows you to do some simple formal communication for example at the beginning of this course i said that you know can you write two programs and they'll say good morning and they'll say well good morning to you and then how are you fine okay so you can you should be able to if you want to send back and forth such kind of things like uh, information between processes, then uh, pipes uh, is a great way to do so. So let's get started. Here is our example. Uh, what we do is uh, we have like uh, initially we make the pipe five uh, system call. And remember this FT is an integer array of two, okay? And after this, then we fork. Okay, in this case, we also have this error, don't worry about that. And then you can see that this is where the, this is executed by the parent process. And this part is executed by the child process. Okay. And uh, how does it work? Uh, let's see here. So initially, when we execute this pipe as such, it creates this pipe, and remember, this one is in the kernel, okay? And it returns you two file descriptors, okay? And uh, like I, in this case, I use them as like, you know, uh, uh, arrows to point the read and write ends of this uh, pipe. Uh, so in the, uh, in three, okay, which appears in FD zero, Okay, in this case, okay, uh, then you have the read end. So from this end, you can read from the pipe and in the FD1, okay, which is four in this case, it you will be able to write into the pipe, okay? So the, like your way, when you do this, of course, by itself, it's not interesting. Of course, you know, you can have fun, like, you know, you can write, this is the right end, okay? And this is the read end, okay? And what you can do is you can communicate by yourself through the uh, kernel space by writing into your FT1 and then reading it, reading it from FT0, okay? So this is like, you know, speaking to yourself, it's like loud. They, they, they may think that you're crazy, but you know, this is what we do, okay? So this is basically, but things get interesting, you know, for this is, this is before four. Now, when we do a fork, then things get interesting and more useful. So when we do a fork, all of a sudden the descriptor table, the file descriptor table is duplicated, okay? So even again for the child, now this is again the FD3, this is the uh, FD0 here and FD1, okay? And this is again FD zero and FD one. Uh, so you can see that now I, I am, it's like, you know, I have opened the same file, both by the parent and the child. 
And so now we can see that through this, I can have some form of communication between them, okay? So in this case, you can see that this is, if I want to use as it is, this is really massive because both the parent and the child, they can both read from the file and write from the, uh, so read into the, uh, from the pipe or write into the pipe, okay? And remember that these two things, like the parent and child can run, you know, asynchronously at random times. So you really don't want to do this. You want to have just a one way of communication. So to do this, typically, you know, you decide to, you know, do I, do I want to use this channel only for one way communication? And what you can do this is you can, for example, if I want to use this pipe as a form of communication by using it changing this into a one dimensional basically interaction medium, okay? So I can close FT, this FT0 for the, uh, so this is uh, for the parent. Remember this was FT0. So this is the parent code and this is the child code, okay? So you close FT0, meaning that you close the read end, okay? And then you write something into the FD1, which is here, okay? This is the FD1, okay? And on the child side, then you close FD1, which means that you said, I'm not going to read from this. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to write into this pipe. I will only read this. And uh, then you read from FD0, okay? So with this, now you have open the channel of communication such that you can send basically data from the parent to the child, okay? Now, you may say that, well, this is nice and uh, like this is all I can do. What if I want to have two, uh, uh, you know, bi-directional communication, meaning that, you know, my parent sends me some data, but if I want to also communicate something back, well, what do you have to do? Any, any suggestions on this? Maybe two pipes? Exactly. Do, do I create pipes before fork or after fork? Before fork, could you? Exactly. So before fork, you just you know, create two pipes. You get again now four descriptors. And you know you use one of them like it's for parent to child communication and the other one from child to parent communication. Well, so with this, you can actually go ahead and write these basically a program and uh, just say, you know, good morning, how are you, and etc. okay? And this is really easy because, you know, all you have to do is you have to read from the pipe or write from the pipe. It's not, it's nothing basically fancy because I'm using the very same semantics. Hocam, mm -hmm. uh, if you create the pipe after a fork, that pipe will be shared, right? Yes, exactly. It will okay. be, it will not be shared. Okay. Hocam, we can't write uh, write to pipe by using the read and it 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 is not isn't vermiyor değil mi hocam isn't vermez sanırım. I'm not sure I understood your problem again. Şey e, okun okunacak taraftan yazmaya çalışamıyoruz değil mi file? No no you can't do that yes. I mean, like if you open like a file in read-only mode, and if you want to write it, then you will get an error, right? Yes, exactly. That, that's correct. So you cannot write into std in because, you know, among with the file, you also have this um, read-only mode or read-write. So you have all these different modes. And in the case of a keyboard, it's only, it's a read-only uh, file. Okay, so this is the basically general idea of a pipe. Now, what you can do is you can do this to implement, well, for example, things like, you know, the, that you see in share. For example, I have this uh, pipe action where like in your shell, this is, you know, this is where my shell is. You say cat, etc. password, pipe into word count minus cell. So what this will do is this will basically uh, tell you how many users, how many lines you have in the password file. So how can I implement this? Remember, uh, in this case, how many processes do I talk about? 
I'm talking about like, you know, the first one is the shell process. The second one is the cat process. The third one is the vertical VC process, okay? So this is a case where I will have three processes being active at any time, okay? Now, let's see, basically, so here's the code for this, and let me just, uh, we will uh, discuss this, you know, how this would work out. So you can see that, okay, this is where my descriptor is. Okay, and then here's my pipe, I create my pipe, okay? And then after that, then, you know, you will see, let me go through here, then let's see this, okay. Here is where my pipe create is done. And then I do, since I have three, uh, processes, the shell process, okay, this is the parent, and then, then I have this cat, and then the word count, okay. So what I do is, like here, I do a fork, okay, and then now this, this code is now the parent code, which is the shell, and in here, I fork again, okay, I fork once more, because I need to create three, uh, three processes, okay, two more processes. So this code that I have here, okay, this code here, now if fork and if form, now this is where my, this is my, where my shell will execute, okay? And in the, in the case of a shell, since I, all I want is in the, in the case of a shell, I created, uh, uh, so here's my shell here, let's see, shell, okay, and then, in this case of shell, I created this pipe. Okay. And so I have this, you know, pointers back and forth as such. And then after that, you know, I forked once. Okay. And then, you know, this is my first child. Let's call this, you know, child one. Okay. And the child one code will be executing here. This is my child one, okay? And then uh, I fork again with the second fork. Now here's this code will be executed by, by my child two, okay? Now I will have this, the child two will appear here. And guess what? They will again have in both of them, they will be pointing to the very same, basically uh, pi like this, okay? Is this clear? If you have any questions, please stop and you know ask. Okay, because otherwise you'll you'll be you'll, you'll be lost. So uh, in the shell case, in the shell case, since what we want to do is we want to create this like we, like we have like a three tasks. I want to uh, create a cat process. I want to create a VC process, and I want to basically. <clears throat> then make sure that they communicate with each other. And after that, we should be gone, okay? But so then, with here, yes. What if a uh, process uh, try to read file, read a file before the one that writes? Uh, it will be blocked. Yeah. It will be blocked. Okay. okay? So uh, since the shell doesn't do anything with the pipes, we close both ends. What this means is, you know, these two will appear. So now shell is completely disconnected, okay? And with them, with uh, the child one and child two, well, you can see that the child two, okay, uh, is executing in the end, okay? It's becoming VC, okay? So this guy will become VC, okay? And the child one, it will be last thing, it will do an exec and it will become cat. Okay. Now, but before doing this, remember, you know, when I do an exec, nothing will be left from me. So before doing this, before doing this, I have to make sure that the, 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 uh, the form of the pipes uh, communications is set. So before this exec, what we do is the following. So we, let me just wrap this up and I will again draw the same things here. So here's my, uh, the first child first or 
Let me just write this as cat because it will eventually become a cat. And here's my word count. Okay. And here's my pipe. Okay. So what, what we do is remember, you know, like with the FD one, with, with the, uh, uh, let's say that this, this is the cat. Okay. Okay. And now this is the, uh, this is the VC. So with the VC, uh, remember the VC wants to read uh, like in the VC case, instead of reading from its uh, standard input, it wants to read from the pi, right? Okay. So with the VC case, what it would do is first, it would close the FD1. Remember FD1 uh, is the, uh, what was it? It was the writing end of this, okay? So it will close this. And then it will do this, which is dupe two, FD zero to zero, okay? Now, what does it mean? Like, remember, in this particular case, we have this descriptor table, descriptor table, and it had, let's say that this is zero, one, and two, okay? And after that, we have uh, now two more, but then we have FD zero, and then FD one, okay? Now, in here, what we do is we do dupe two FD zero to zero. What this means is, remember, FD zero was the reading end, okay? FD read or FD zero was reading from the, uh, from the pi, right? That's it. And when I do FD zero to, to zero, what I actually do is I copy this pointer into here, okay? And all of a sudden, when I do this, now, instead of reading from the keyboard, it will be reading from the pipe, okay? So word count or VC will be reading from the pipes read end, okay? Uh, instead of the keyboard, okay? So this is what it achieves. And after doing this, then it, it closes FD zero. So now, now that I'm done, I can close this, okay? And then it does this exec, which means that when it, when it does this, then this whole process is replaced by the executable of VC. And then it does what it's supposed to do, which means it reads data from its input, which is the uh, read end of the pipe. And then it counts the number of lines and then it prints this out, that's it, okay? Now let's look at the cat part, which is here. And the cat part, again, now I will draw this here. I will have zero, one, two. Okay, this is standard input, output and standard error. And then I will have FD zero here zero, and then FD one, okay? Now in the case of cat, what I want is instead of writing into the uh, standard output, I want this to write into the pipe, into the pipe, okay? And here, what I do is, uh, since I want to write into the pipe, uh, remember, it, I close FT0 because FT0 was the reading end. Okay, so you close FT0, it's gone. Okay. And then I do duplicate FT1 to 1. Okay. So this one, you can say that this is the or STD out, right? This is STD out. So now what happens is, let me again go back, switch back to blue. So I copy FD1, which is this one, and FD1 was basically pointing to the right end of this pipe. So I copy this to one. So instead of write, so that means that when this process wants to write into its standard output, it will be writing 
into the pipe, okay? And after doing this, then it closes FD1, which is, now this one is gone because I, it served its purpose. And then finally, it does this exec and then it becomes cat, okay? Any questions on this? This is a, you know, and in the meantime, okay, you can see that what, what does my shell do? My shell, it closes, it disconnects itself from the pipe. And after that, it does a wait. It waits for the cat. Uh, so it waits, it's not doing a wait PID, but it does just a wait. So it waits for these both processes to terminate and then it will get their return values, okay, into this cat, into this C. Of course, Ojan. it's not using this, yes. Is dup2 a system call? Yes, dup2 is a system call because it's modifying this kernel level data structure called the descriptor tail. Yes. Any, any other questions? Hocam, uh, is the order of the exec exacts important? Like for example, uh, could I like do the exec for cats before and later the, the exec for BC. I mean, can I swap the as blocks there, the contents of the as blocks? Uh, well, um, I, you mean you can, well, okay. When you do a four, remember, you have no control over the time, uh, over the timing, okay? Oh yeah, yeah, right. Yes. right. So after that, they are completely separate. It doesn't matter where they appear. Oh yeah, yeah, makes sense, yeah, thank you. Okay. So, I mean, like you may not realize this, but you know, this is a whole magical stuff, right? Okay. Through this, like, you know, this is, this is program that you've never seen so far. And this looks like magic to most people. And it's very exciting. It surely looks like magic, John. <laughs> okay. Well, you have to try this. So, well, this is not the magic that I would say that, you know, don't try at home. No, no, no. Try this at home, please. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Any other questions? Jim, after folks, we don't know which process, which child process goes first. So exactly. Oh, you know, I mean, if uh, the word count, I mean, word count expects cat to mm -hmm. finish first, right? Right. We don't, we don't have any weight in child code segments. So how does it wait for the other child? It doesn't, it doesn't. Remember like, you know, for the, for example, for the cat, okay? It will try to write this into the pie, right? So there's nothing blocks because the pipe is open, so it will write. Like now let's say that the word count here, it starts from first. So it tries to read from its standard input, which is the pipe, and there's nothing there. So if that is like, since read is a system call, it will be put on hold, okay? until the cat process inserts data into the pipe. Because okay, so it's a blocking, so when you do a read, like which is what the word count does, uh, like remember, like if you want to read something from the keyboard, what happens? Well, if you want to, uh, if the, you have to wait for the user to type in and press enter, right? Until he presses enter, your process is blocked. The same thing happens with the word count. Okay, so when we want to use pipe, we have to wait for something to come. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. So if there are no further questions, I will move on. Hojam, uh, mm -hmm. again, can you explain why we use wait in shell? Why we use wait here? In shell. In the shell, uh -huh. well, I mean, you don't have to like. You know, why do we do this? Like, in the, this is the regular shell code, right? When you run, like uh, in this case, the shell will point back to here. It will back, it come back to you only after this whole uh, execution is finished. This is what happens in your shell, right? It doesn't return you back immediately. It waits for the cat and the bird count terminate before giving back uh, your, the shell command again. 
yep, yep, makes sense. Thank you. But like, but, without to uh, without to wait, it will work either. Like, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So for example, and this is actually like you know, when if you have a shell here, okay, I have a shell, and you can say that you know, for example, ls, you know, say minus l, and you try to write this into a file, say that you know a.txt and imagine that this is like you know, like lr so it's like recursive thing and if you put the ampersand and it runs in the background and then come back to me here and this is what, what when you see that this is essential saying that don't wait for me and all you have to do is you just have to omit these weights here so that it doesn't wait for the child process to end before coming back to you okay So uh, with the pipes, uh, this is really nice. And this is basically, you have seen this in action in the shell by passing the output of one program to another one in this form. Now there are a number of limitations. So this is an inter-process communicate, it's an IPC mechanism. And the, the limitations are the processes needs to be relatives. So you can use this for parent-child communication or siblings, meaning that you know, I have a parent and I have two childs here, so I can let them communicate. So like they have to be siblings, okay? And the second thing is you cannot use this for broadcasting, meaning that, you know, uh, you know I want to have like I'll say one process here. And maybe if I want to send the same message to all of them, say that, you know, like say it's child one, child two, child three, then this is not good because since this is a pipe, remember like if whatever I message that I put into a pipe, if one of the children uh, reads it from the pipe, it's gone. So the, the whatever you put into that cannot be read by multiple processes at the time, okay? It's just like a, some, like, I don't know, like a, some a cement or a, a piece of cake that you put on a table. When somebody reads it, it's gone. It cannot read more. So it's not, it cannot use be for broadcasting. And it's a byte stream, meaning it doesn't have any structure. And this can be important. For example, you have, uh, say that like this, this is essentially a whole, like this is like a, 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 um, a byte stream, okay? And remember that, you know, with the child and the parent, when you try to, like write into the pipe or read from the pipe, they can, they may not be atomic at all times. And remember, when you're running these different processes, the operating system can stop this at any time and switch to something else. Okay. So, for example, you want to write, say, yeah, I know, hello, you know, like, you know, uh, hello world. But what you like after writing, say, hell. Okay. And then, you know, the, uh, the operating system may decide to put you on hold and run the other process, which can then come back and it will read hell instead of because the rest is not done. And it has no idea whether you know, this was the full string or other things. So this can be kind of like this makes it difficult to communicate between two processes and you have to insert some extra things like what you had to mark the uh, beginning or the end of the, And once you read this, well, next time you have to go back and you have to read until maybe backslash n and then put them together. So this is a little bit messy. And uh, the second one is, you know, when you have several readers or writers, then you have like no idea who is writing what. It's just like, you know, whatever I say, but like it's, it's, it's mashed up into things. Like if I have, for example, two writers into the same thing, okay? Say so this guy, like P1 is supposed to write hello and P2 is say, supposed to write, you know, world, okay? In this case, you know, the first thing it can appear as like this P1 may write hell and then, the, then P2 may be writing, you know, world or like wo, okay? And then I was switching back to P1 and it will say, Another O, and then that P switch P P two, then it will say uh, world. Okay, so you can see that like if you have multiple readers or writers, then things will be messy. Okay, 
uh, but this is fast and it's not a very useful to uh, share large amounts of data but this is uh, and as i said this is implemented as the internal kernel buffer or like your know, socket buffers or stream interface now let's move on and uh, to another type of pipe and this is like it's called the name but this is known as FIFO or first in first out. Now the FIFOs, they are just like the pipes, exactly. Except that they appear as a pad on the file system, okay? These are persistent and it has a name. It is a permission and it, uh, and it appears like an ordinary file, okay? And you can see this in LS. And it can be accessed by any process that knows the name because it appears as a file and have the appropriate permissions. Okay, and it appears it persists even if after all the processes have closed. Them. In the case of unnamed pipes, it's a data structure that it, that remains in the system as long as the processes that uses them that are linked to them are executing. Okay, so when these when all those processes are terminate, then the associated pipe structure also disappears from the system. Okay, and so next time if you want to do that, then th that that's the case. In the case of a named pipe, it appears as a special file. Okay, and uh, whatever you write into them, then it will remain there. For example, uh, in the case of an unnamed pipe. Uh, both the reader, the both the writer and the reader has to be executing concurrently to have this communication. But in the case of a named pipe, the writer can appear, it will write its uh, message or data into the pipe and then terminate, okay? But it will, it's, um, you can think this as a pipe. And then the reader comes, opens the same, like uh, uh, the, this pipe, reads the data that it has written and then disappears okay so they don't have to be uh, uh, be concurrently uh, uh, alive at the same time so these five force they can be uh, created using you know make FIFO, FIFO from the command or from a command shell or make five for system call within a program okay and <clears throat> Uh, they, as I said, in the case of a pipe, you know, the, the, it's restricted communication is restricted to the processes of the same family. Uh, pipes are temporary; they disappear when the last process that's accessing it closes. Whereas the file files are named pipes; they are special files that persist, just like an actual file, even if after all the processes uh, uh, basically are terminated. Okay and that any process which knows them and use has the appropriate permissions can access them. And this is basically how you can create them. So as I said, in the, in a shell, you can create them like this. This is essentially like a creating a file, right? So just give it a name and maybe a mode, okay? And that's it, they can make sure you should read this man page for this. And, you know, uh, since they persist, uh, if you want to use them, like uh, when you're done, it's a good idea to remove them as if uh, removing is essentially just removing a file after use, okay? So here is an example how it works. We created say three pipes here in this, uh, in our directory. Then we can see ls, and then we pipe this, send this into pipe. Now, and then we have cat, okay? And it cats this file into pipe two, and then who and pipes into pipe three. Okay. And then after them, well, then you can read from these pipes. Okay. For example, your cat can read you from your LPR and pipe one, which your know, LS by itself have exited, and then send it to printer. Or spell can read from pipe two and so on. Okay. And finally, then you should delete your pipes. Okay. And this is the corresponding system call. As I said, if you don't count comps, it's the same version. Uh, so here's the path for the, for, for the, uh, the, for the uh, pipe, 
And here's the mode, okay, which specifies the permissions for this FIFO. And you know, the function returns zero, otherwise, if there is an error, it returns minus one and sets error in all here. So here is a simple again, you know, example that we have here. Okay. And uh, so here's our basically main code. Okay. In here, what we do is we create a path, we define that. So this is basically we create this. Uh, this doesn't have to be, this can be instead of FIFO, it can be, you know, say full, whatever it's name, it doesn't have to be FIFO. So this is the name of the uh, main pipe, okay? And then with this, okay, then the first thing that we do is we do an unlinked path. This is remove this file if it exists, okay? And then you create your file, okay? with the permissions. And after this, then we do a fork, okay? And then with the fork, then this is the child, ex child executes this and the parent executes that. Let's see, yes. Okay. Now, in this case, uh, let's see what the parent does. In the case of a parent, well, it opens the uh, FIFO <coughs> in read-only mode, okay? And then it reads, and it, then as a result of this, it gets a file descriptor. And then it can read from this into this buffer with this many bytes, okay? And here's a child. The child also opens the same thing. Now it reads as write-only. And in this form, we have a communication. We are using this FIFO from a child to parent communication, okay? The child is, and then if the child writes into this file descriptor with whatever this buffer, in this case, the buffer, we, like the sample is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, okay? And this is the size of the buffer. It sends it and after it closes it and it exits. And here's the parent, it reads it, it receives it and then it closes. Okay, so <clears throat> this is again, uh, this, uh, this is a simple communication between uh, the child and the parent. So, oh, let's just see. Okay, we have already discussed this. Uh, let me stop here, okay? And our time is up. And if you have any questions, I can take them and after that we'll uh, end the lecture. Jean, I Jean. have a question. Okay, okay go ahead. You go, Adam. Uh, so, okay. Mujam, as I understood, uh, these FIFO queues are some kind of dummy file variables to uh, provide inter-process uh, inter communication. Mm -hmm. uh, what is FIFO queues advantage over some uh, dummy text files, uh, which we forward with greater sign to it and then use it as input for other processes? Uh, it is similar. Uh, you will see later that we also have memory mapped files. And uh, in the case of a file, uh, you have to deal with, uh, I think, uh, with the synchronization because when you write into a file, mm, that's a good, good question. But the, like we have to check how it's implemented. I, I, I'm wondering whether writing into a file uh, will be as fast as because then in that case, you will be using the file system interface. It may have some downsides, but I'm not very clear on this. Okay. I think it's, as you say, it will probably have some downsides since uh, mm -hmm. the files will be connected to the disk mm -hmm. and the buffers have to be flushed, etc. But a pipe is just a memory region inside the, it's just a buffer in RAM in the kernel right. space. So it's going to be faster, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe so, but this is something that, that's for checking. Because it depends on the file system implementation. Right. If it's a RAMFS, for example, I guess it might be too different. Right. Uh, I think Pelin had a question, right? Yes, Hojam. Uh, if the parent process works first, uh, mm -hmm. it waits for the child, right? Yes. It will, since when, when like it does a read, it will, be, it will be blocked. Exactly. So in years, it will be blocked just in, for, in the first case. Correct. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Okay. Will you have a quiz today? Uh, no. Okay. One friend asked this. 
Okay, too bad for you. Sorry. Hocam, when we call read, if there is nothing to read, then it blocks, right? Uh, uh, well, okay, the read has like two different versions. There is the blocking version and the non-blocking version. In the uh, blocking version, like it waits for that many. We say that, for example, you can say that in this case, so read here, okay? Uh, usually, if you re look at them in the, uh, you tell him how many bits to read, okay? And uh, it can read either that much amount or sometimes it can get a shortcut, meaning that it may, the read can return, for example, you want to read eight characters, but it may read only four characters and then it will actually tell you how many characters it has read so far. But that can also be the blocked version, which is when you issue a read, it will wait for all those characters to arrive before it returns back to you. In the case of a short count, which means that you, know, you want to read say eight characters, but only four have arrived, it will continue to wait and you cannot, your program will be blocked until the remaining four characters uh, arrives. Okay, we call them blocking and non-blocking calls and usually there are these two different versions of the same uh, system call. Okay. Okay. Okay, so that's by default it's blocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By yes. default it blocks. Yes. Are there any other questions? John, I have a question too. Sure. Uh, what if the, our uh, buffer in the child is very large that it exceeds the buffer size? Then uh, the, is parent going to receive as much as the buffer size? No. Well, when when the when the child is writing into the buffer, uh, what in this case in the in the five four since it appears as a file, I don't think there's a limit. I can yet to read the manual page, okay? But in the case of, for example, unnamed pipes, you know, if you, if you try to write more characters than the size of the pipe, then you will be blocked. You'll be blocked until the reader reads and empties the pipe, and then you can continue, okay? Thanks. Any other questions? Hocam. Okay, go ahead, Dennis. Uh, if we are expecting variable length of input, uh, for example, if we going to uh, write what uh, what's coming from the input, mm -hmm. uh, how will we know uh, we we have read, read uh, all of the things? Uh, well, you don't know. That's a good question. You don't know. I mean, for example, like it's not like, you know, uh, like the only way to do that is usually you have to form some kind of a protocol. I mean, you know, I mean, you may have heard that, you know, like you say that you write your full sentence and then you say, okay, over and out, I'm done, okay? And then what, what it means when you read it, you know that the other guy is not finished yet until that particular one is, that, that particular end of line or end of conversation is in there. But you cannot check this. You cannot, for example, you know, when you read, even if the message is partial, then once you read them, you're gone. Like it's no longer in the pipe. So you have the responsibility to concatenate them into, into one full message before passing to the other parts. Okay? Okay, thank you. That's why it's actually super annoying <laughs> to use yeah. streams. Exactly. Like pipes and TCP sockets, et cetera. And what I suggest is you know, like, you know, we have, we are giving these snippets of code and again, you know, go ahead and read, like uh, look at Steven's book as well. It also has a lot of snippets, okay? And try this, like uh, try these, all these different questions that you have in mind and want to ask me, try them out and then see, you know, for yourself, okay? Okay, so that's it for today, guys. So uh, well, I'll see you next week. Yes, because it is.